this particular lesson, I'm, I'm going to refer to some scriptures a little bit more than I usually do, and I don't apologize for that. I'm, I'm trying to strike a balance because there are people that don't necessarily have a foundation in spiritual matters, and they need hope, and we need to help them have some kind of a hope in life. I'm talking there about just events and situations that occur in life. But we do want to move them towards true and lasting hope, which is found in our Lord. So I'm trying to strike a balance between a discussion about, uh, I hate to draw the distinction, a secular perspective and a spiritual perspective. We understand, and I, I said it the other day, but I'll say it again, we understand that those two should be combined. And, and we, our life... Uh, the secular concepts within our life are still viewed by those of us that are children of our Lord from uh, that spiritual perspective as well. Uh, we grow to the point where we are, we try to grow to the point where we're like Christ in everything. But the world doesn't necessarily understand that. That's why we do draw that artificial distinction between secular and spiritual. And, and so we, we do want that. But uh, this particular lesson, I'm trying to strike a balance I'm, I'm going to be looking at some scriptures that, again, some thoughts that occurred to me as I've studied this and looked through it. So let, let's, let's begin with that. I always like to define terms to make sure, as uh, the old saying goes, we're breathing the same air. In other words, we're understanding things the same way. So a guarantee, there we go. A guarantee uh, uh, is, is a promise about something. And if a guarantee is in writing, then that's considered the most secure form of guarantee. You, you write it and sign it, or it's printed up and you sign it. And it, it serves in many situations as a legal document. It's in writing that this is promised, and so therefore it has to be fulfilled. What is, uh, what is the thing... Uh, satisfaction guaranteed or your money back for example or uh, if it's not done right we'll make it right or something like that so it serves as a, as a legal binding contract in some situations uh, we find god guarantees throughout the writing within scriptures don't we uh, and one of the most compelling and tender guarantees I love Isaiah chapter 49, verses 15 and 16. Israel had rebelled against God and they're, and, and, and they're banished. But God says in Isaiah 49, 15 and 16, Can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold. I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. And so God says, even though you're being punished, I have not forgotten you. Uh, a, a mother may forget her child, but I will not forget you. Engraved on the palm of my hand. And, and years ago, uh, when I came across that concept, Somebody had written a lesson. They had asked the question, well, when did God write your name on the palm of his hand? And the person made the point. It was on the cross when our Lord was crucified for us. I, I don't necessarily understand it that way. Uh, I see it in the sense of it's, it, it's the imagery of our name being tattooed, if I can use that expression, on the palms of our Lord. You know, the idea of a tattoo is pretty hard to remove it. And, and so that, that's the idea that it's there. It's always before our Lord. Every time the imagery is that he opens his hand, he s would see the promise. Uh, what, what a beautiful concept that is. That's a pretty strong guarantee that he made to Israel in that poetic expression. But it's something that we can hold on to as well. And so this passage, uh, an incredible passage, it kind of sums up the entirety of God's promise. He's not going to forget us. So many times we might think that he has. All this is happening for me. God has just forgot me. 
Isn't it interesting that every time something bad happens, well, not every time, quite often when something bad happens to people, they want to blame God for it? God didn't author the bad things. He allows them for a variety of reasons, but it was sin that brought evil into the world and all of its manifestations, not God. God didn't want us to. All right, so we're going to move into that. But anyway, it's, this, this passage symbolizes we can, we're always before God. His love is always there. That's a wonderful guarantee, and don't ever lose sight of that no matter the challenges that we face. All right, a guarantee uh, is also a surety against loss. It's not a clean illustration, uh, but uh, I, I thought about this. Imagine you went to one of our local pawn shops here in town, and you, you walked up to the counter and you said, I, I need to borrow some money. And uh, the person behind the counter says, well, okay, what are you going to put up? to guarantee the, the loan, and you say, well, I really don't have anything to put up. Imagine if the person there said, well, I'll tell you what, I, I trust you. I, I think you'll do well. I'll put something up to guarantee you, the loan I'm going to give you. That's just not going to happen, is it, in, in, at, a, at our local pawn shop? They're going to say, sorry you don't have anything to put up and to guarantee this loan, then you're not going to get the loan. Well, the idea of a guarantee is that there's a surety against loss. A surety is something that's given as a deposit or to give control of something to someone else uh, of suitable value or even of greater value uh, that it's going to provide for the payment of debt in a case that you don't or can't pay it, whatever. That's the idea of a surety. And then the one offering the guarantee is referred to as the guarantor. And then that's, that's just amazing. Our Lord makes the guarantee. And I want to spend some time on that this morning. So there's the idea of, of the, the guarantor is offering the guarantee. Uh, that's the, the guarantor. So to bring it kind of all together, our Heavenly Father offers a binding contract with us. It's written through His Holy Word, the Bible. It's offered through His Son, given in our place. It's a security of the promise of eternal life, that, that being of our Lord Jesus. And we can be assured of the hope that we attain through our salvation. We can be assured. And it's, it's, it's really, uh, well, again, I don't want to use the expression sad, but there's a greater level of joy in our life as we're able to understand that more. What's the difference between happiness and joy? Yeah, happiness quite often is temporary. I'm happy in the moment. And the idea of joy that we're talking about from scriptures is that no matter life's situations, the temporariness of it, the, the, there's joy in our life and, and we move beyond it. Yes, we're saddened during life events or we're made happy during life events. But the totality of it is the joy is going to be there and the joy is going to grow. That, that's the idea that we hold there. And so God made us a promise and guaranteed that promise both in writing and by providing surety through Jesus Christ. And the expectation is that we're going to take hold of that as our Lord directs us to. And, and then because of that, as we understand it more and accept it more, our joy continues to grow. Uh, the guarantees are important to us, and so God provides a guarantee for our salvation. So that, that kind of brings all together the idea that uh, it's legally binding. Our Lord made a promise, and he's always faithful to his promises. And uh, the surety against loss, he 
put it into effect through his son Jesus. And then he himself has done this. The remarkable thing is not only did he make the promise and the guarantee, but that surety is part of God himself. I mean, you know, what is the expression, skin in the game? You know, I'm putting something into it. Then that's exactly what he's done. All right, so we see the guarantees are important to us, and, and our Lord provides it. I want to move to a remarkable scripture, 1 Peter 3, starting in verse 3. I'll read this. 1 Peter chapter 3, oh, excuse me, chapter 1. Did I say three? First Peter chapter one, three through five is where we are. Think about Peter. I, 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 we, we love to study Peter because we see his brashness and his, his self-assurances and things like that in ourselves. But man, Peter, from what he was, to what he became. Uh, you wonder what Peter was like in his younger years before uh, we see him uh, in Scripture as a, as a child and a young man growing up. He had to have been the way he was in his early years as he was when we see him in Scripture for him to have developed that personality. I, I bet he, at times, I say I bet. Boy, I wish we wouldn't use that expression, I bet. <laughs> I suspect at times Peter might have been a bully. He might have been uh, the ringleader on some things because he was so brash and outgoing. And yet when you read his writings and see how he became who he eventually became, uh, but you see it in his writings, a humility where he has moved himself out of the picture and, and uh, I talk about it a lot of times how one of the first things that has to happen before we're truly useful to the Lord is we have to become humble. Our Lord uses us from our humility to do great things for him. We see that in Peter. But, but let me read from 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That's a, that's a wonderful statement that Peter's making here. And there's some important points in there that should give us hope. You know, we think about Peter again. Uh, there was a time when Peter was or felt he was entirely without hope. When he denied our Lord and our Lord acknowledged that as he looked at him and Peter realized that what our Lord had said was going to happen has happened and he went out and wept bitterly, Peter felt there's just no hope. How can I be forgiven? And you see it, by the way. You suspect it, I should say. Because when our Lord, after his resurrection, and the apostles are gathered together, and our Lord appears before him, notice Peter doesn't rush out in that gathering initially. You get the image there that Peter's kind of hanging back a little bit in that initial uh, uh, reappearance of our Lord to the apostles. You don't see Peter out in front. It's, you don't see Peter really out in front significantly until our Lord reinstates him. And so Peter now is grabbing hold of that, and he's trying to communicate that to us. And so we see that through this. Peter's describing hope in a very real, as a very real and living thing. Uh, it, it, he's communicating understanding and trust that God's going to be faithful to us. Uh, and so we have a confidence because of God's faithfulness. And it should cause us, God is faithful to us, we have confidence in that, so it causes us to be faithful to him in return. That, that, that's the relationship there. 
And it, it truly is, as Peter's communicating here, according to his great mercy. It's based on God's mercy. He didn't have to. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. You know that scripture. Faith is one of them. There's another one right before. Grace. grace. Yeah, grace and faith. And it's grace and faith that just simply means God's going to give it to me and I believe he's going to give it to me. Is that all that means? As Michael Brock likes to say, do your head this way. <laughs> it's an obedient faith, isn't it? It's an active faith as, as our Lord and James talks about. And that act of faith includes our acceptance, our repentance, our baptism, and our faithful living, all of that. But it's through God's grace. That, that's a key word there, uh, faith, obviously, as well. But uh, the idea of grace, that's God's mercy, his grace. He didn't have to, but he did. He wanted to because of his love for us. And it's not based on our perfection, is it? You know Romans 3.23. Come on. We were still sinners. Yeah. While we were sinners, God gave his son for us. And it also says in verse 24 there, Romans 3, 24, we're justified by his grace. Not ourselves. So it's because we strive to be faithful to God. Uh, we, we, we grow in that hope. We understand greater. But Peter says it very well, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. We need to communicate that to people. I, people expect that they've got to become a good person and then the Lord will accept them. It just doesn't work that way. It cannot work that way. God takes us as we are, but as we are must be penitent and humble and willing to accept what our Lord asks for us. And when we follow through obedience to the Lord, uh, the, the promise is there. That's always been the case. Our, our Lord says, if you'll do this, and, and so we've, we've got to communicate that to people. All right, so there's, a, there's some great words in this passage. The promise is imperishable. What comes to mind when you hear the word imperishable? It's not going to go away, is it? It's not going to rot. It's not going to end. It's imperishable. Not going to go away. He says, uh, it cannot end. He says it's undefiled. What does undefiled mean? I mean, it, there's, there's no, there's no, um, there's no hidden or blemish or whatever to it. It's undefiled. Yeah, the example the brother gave is, uh, you know, you look at a guarantee. What is it? I love the expression, what the large print giveth, the fine print taketh away. Uh, that's what happens. We'll, we'll have a guarantee in writing, big, bold words, guarantee. And, and, and then a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller, and pretty soon you got to get out the magnifying glass. You see that on TV, don't you? They'll throw something on a commercial up there, and then down at the bottom for about two seconds, there'll be a whole paragraph written so small it's absolutely impossible to read it. You'd have to record it, freeze it, and enhance it to be able to read it. So, yeah, that's not God's promise. It's there, very clear, undefiled, and it's not going to go away. So it's imperishable, it's undefiled, and it's unfading. I like that. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, by the way. Unfading. It does not diminish in its power. It doesn't fade away. There's no, there's no time limit on it. Uh, the Lord doesn't say, okay, uh, 10 years is up. That's it. Yeah, it's there. Uh, I'm, I'm delving again into the world of life insurance. Um, if, if you've had a... a debilitating disease or some kind of disease that's life-threatening, good luck trying to get regular insurance. It, 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 even if it's out there, it's going to cost you more than you can possibly afford. And, and so, you know, we have this thing called whole life policies and term policies. Uh, our, our Lord is indeed a whole life. As long as we're living faithfully, 
and, and I've said it so many times, it wasn't original with me, but I love the expression that God does not demand perfection, but he does demand faithfulness. And he takes care of the rest of it. So, imperishable, undefiled, unfading. And then, I love this part of this passage. And this is something that when I read this, it jumped out at me and I looked at it again. And it's like, wow. Kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded. Is there anything greater than God's power? God's guarding it for us. thought that struck me when I read this is that God is guarding it for us. I interpreted that as God is serving us. I just understood it that way. And can there be no greater example of why we need to serve than the idea that God is serving us. He's serving us by holding it for us, taking care of it and guarding it, making sure that it's there. Nothing is going to take it away. Nothing can possibly take it away, not even himself. That, that's an amazing concept of it too. God doesn't move away from us. He can't. He made the promise. We, on the other hand, can move away from our Lord. He takes us back when we violate our term of agreement, but then when we repent, he takes us back. And, and, and that's a promise, too, that he will. So Peter describes God's role in this, ver in this verse by saying that, that our Lord is guarding it for us. It's there. It's going to be there. It's, it's just guaranteed in the strongest way possible. Um, I had a, a, a corollary of sorts in 2 Peter. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. I use the illustration. I don't think I used it extensively in the presentation last week talking about the stages of growth we go through from hope sparked, hope sensed, hope seen. The idea that hope sparked is a glimmer. And I, I, in, in the, the book, I go into detail about it for each one, but it's, it's the idea that in the early, early morning, when it's on the deepest and darkest night, when you see a little glimmer of the sunrise, uh, and, and then as the sun begins to come up, you see a little bit more, and then that, when the sun is fully out, you see all around us, the darkness is dispelled. We can see clearly, and, and that, that particular verse Again, I think about that illustration as I read it again. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Last week, Brent used the illustration that we've heard before so many times, but it's still a wonderful illustration about being in a deep, dark cave and just a little spark of light seems to illuminate everything. That, that's the imagery there. And so we're living in a world of darkness, despair, no hope, and yet there is hope. And the closer we draw to the light of our Lord, the greater the illumination and we can see our way forward. It, it's just an a interesting corollary. So that's 2 Peter 1.19. God guarantees God guards the guarantee. That's hope. Uh, no matter what our life holds, our Lord is there, and he is faithful to us. I want to move now to the book of Hebrews for this next element of it. Hebrews can be seen as a complicated book, 
bottom line on Hebrews is the superiority of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if you would, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6. We're talking about how our Lord guarantees our hope. And, and again, the reason that we want to know this is, is not just so it reassures us about our hope and helps keep us faithful, but that we can communicate it and teach it to others. Is Christianity hard? Is being faithful hard? Yeah, sometimes because of so much on us. But even greater is the reward for our faithfulness, both in this life and, of course, in the life to come. And so how God, how God guards and guarantees our hope, we can read about in Hebrews chapter 6. I'm not necessarily going to read through all of this, but uh, starting in about verse 13, uh, all the way through 20, uh, the heading that the English Standard puts in there is the certainty of God's promise. So that's what I want to kind of focus on. So in, in verses 13 through 17, we read about how God made a promise to us. So in Genesis 3, we read about the fall of man. And then in verse 15, God injects the first spark or glimmer of hope that one day our Lord would come, offer himself as a sacrifice for us. That, that began the promise was first revealed in a, in a very small way, but a very critical way there in Genesis 3.15. So this is when God first revealed his plan to restore us to his re, uh, relationship with him. But then later, our Lord, uh, he formalized that promise with Abram, who became Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12, 1 and 2. And... Uh, Another one of those aha moments a few years ago when we were having a class next door with our deaf community, we were studying this, and, and our, the promise that God made Abram was that I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you, and then he says in verse 2, so that you will be a blessing to others. And I've kind of used that as an internal thing. All the blessings that the Lord has given me, I, I have... And am growing to always look at that from the perspective of how can I use this to glorify our Lord. I challenge myself on that all the time. I'm not always successful in that, but I do try to do that. So Genesis 12, 1 and 2, we see our Lord formalizing that promise that began in Genesis 3, 15. But that wasn't the only time he did that. There were, there were uh, four other occasions in which he re establish that promise in Genesis 13, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, Genesis 22. As time and events marched on, our Lord reinstated that promise. He says, well, I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. I made a promise to your father, and I made a promise to your forefathers. I make the promise to you. And so he did that each time. So I encourage you to read those times that doesn't allow me to do it, but Genesis 13, Genesis 15, Genesis 17 and 22. So even though man moved away from God, he remained faithful, always to his promise. And the, the, the condition was, if you'll repent and come back to me, the promise is still there. And there was always a remnant that would remain faithful. And we see that so many times in Scripture goes back to, I've written on the palm of my hand, we are always there before our Lord. It's, it's just a great promise. So God repeats the promise these four other times. Uh, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, he preserved it with an oath. Let's look at that particular verse, and then we'll move on. Uh, him, in him you also... When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So, so again, God's just making this promise. It's guaranteed. It's preserved with an oath. Uh, God wanted us to know that he, he's given us an ironclad agreement. 
All right, it's also, uh, going back to Hebrews 6, let me go back to that. It's, it's the illustration of an anchor. God gives us an anchor to hold on to. We can, we can grasp that promise. Hebrews chapter 6. By two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to... We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, of a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. So we, we have an anchor is the illustration there. When is an anchor most valuable? An anchor keeps us from drifting, yes, but in a storm it's very valuable because it helps keep us stable. Life's got storms, absolutely. And again, we have hope because we have this anchor that holds us firm. And the anchor, of course, is the guarantee, the promise that our Lord has given us. It's going to establish, it's not only going to establish, but it's going to sustain our relationship with him. Uh, God will not break that anchor. Cannot. But again, we can. We can remove ourselves from the security. But don't. And if we find that we have, our Lord is ready to take us back. He doesn't move away, we do. Uh, and, and certainly we understand that there's a danger if we remove that anchor. We will drift. We will capsize. And life will be in even greater turmoil without hope. The point is, uh, if, if we remove ourselves, then we, for, we forfeit the hope. We walk away from the guarantee. We shred the guarantee and throw it away. Uh, don't do that. Uh, we must remain faithful. God will not turn us loose. He's not going to punish us for our mistakes when we remain faithful. Now, when we repent of our sins, he's going to take us back. 1 John chapter 1, 5 through 10. And then the last point I want to make out of this is it provides a means to secure. Our Lord provided the means to secure it. Uh, we've touched on this. Uh, guarantees come a lot of times. A guarantee is going to come at a cost. No. And our Lord doesn't give us a 90-day guarantee. The guarantee is there. And, and so it, it, it uh, did come with a cost. And the cost, of course, was our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And there's an additional cost. And the cost is our faithfulness. We die to self, take on our Lord. And so, yes, it costs us our submission to the Lord. But the guarantee is worth it. So our Lord provided the sacrifice himself, part of himself. Because of sin, our relationship with God was harmed. Uh, by ourselves, we have no hope of being reconciled to God. So God put in place his plan for salvation. That was his grace. Uh, it's a guarantee that provides hope. Uh, we looked at Peter's statement in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 6. Uh, we cannot reconcile ourselves to God. God made a promise. God gave us an anchor, and then he provided a means to secure the hope. He said it, it's written, and then he demonstrated it. So friends, let's put that into our lives and stand on that hope. But let's communicate that to others as we see around us that there is hope. There is a guarantee of hope, and you can have it. It's through our Lord. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Next week, by the way, we're going to talk about outrageous courageousness. It takes courage to hope. And so we're going to look at what that means.